we do it. All right? Uh, they're not quite ready, but uh, they'll probably be ready, <clears throat> I would imagine, about uh, the time we take a break. Or you can wait until the end of the day, whatever your pleasure is. All right. Mr. Thompson. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Uh, Professor, uh, I'd like to direct your attention to tab 16 in your binder. And this is uh, a document from the uh, CDC website from 2004 entitled Assistive Reproductive Technology, uh, which is uh, in the first sentence of the document is, uh, the shorthand is ART. And then if you turn to the second page, uh, in the second full sentence, it says approximately 1% of U.S. infants born in 2004 were conceived through ART. Professor, is it your understanding that 99% uh, of all children born in the United States are born of, as a result of a procreative act between a man and a woman and not through ART? They're not statistics that I've looked into at all. Okay. Uh, Your Honor, we would ask the court to take judicial notice of uh, DIX 1049. Well? Um, professor, turning to uh, tab 19, although I, I, I guess before we get there, let me ask you, do you agree that population growth is no longer necessarily seen as so desirable? Where? Uh, that, that In the is, United States. Uh, it, uh, not so, as so desirable as it was two centuries ago. Yes, I believe that is true. Okay. And uh, directing your attention to the second page uh, behind tab 19, this is a document entitled Low Fertility, Can Governments Make a Difference? Uh, by a gentleman who's at the United Nations, dated uh, April 2, 2004. It's DIX 1046, and on the second page in the second full paragraph, it states, a growing number of countries view their low birth rates with the resulting population decline and aging to be a serious crisis, jeopardizing the basic foundations of the nation and threatening its survival. Economic growth and vitality, defense, and pensions and health care for the elderly, for example, are all areas of major concern. Uh, Professor, do you know whether it's true that in the United States the birth rate is barely at the replacement rate? I think it's approximately at the replacement rate, but of course in the United States immigration has always been a great source of our population growth. We have not relied strictly on uh, reproduction. Illegal immigration? No. Oh. Immigration oh. that has been legal. Oh, um, I, I see. Immigration that has been encouraged and legal through our history. Okay. And uh, the birth rate has declined from significantly from about 3.5 in the 1960s to about 2.1 today. Is that correct? I haven't reviewed these statistics recently. That sounds like it could be right, but I, I can't confirm. Your Honor, we would ask the court to take judicial notice of DIX 1046. Well. Uh, professor, I'd like to ask you to turn your attention to tab 20. Um, and this is uh, an interview with uh, Jonathan Rausch. Uh, Mr. Rausch is uh, a prominent supporter of gay rights, is he not? I really don't know. Okay. Uh, we'd, uh, and this is DIX 1035. I'd like to direct your attention to uh, the, the third page of this document. Uh, and in particular to the paragraph that's the fourth full paragraph. And it says, marriage is not like voting, something the government just gives you at the stroke of a pen by fiat. Marriage must be a community institution to have its full power, which is to make couples actually closer. It actually fortifies and not just ratifies relationships. Your marriage has to be recognized by your community, your friends, your family, your kids' teachers, your coworkers, all of the people around you as a marriage with all of the expectations and social support that goes with that. The law can't give you that. Is Mr. Rausch right that the law can't give you uh, the full power of marriage without the community support? 
I've maintained through my work that law and society work in a dynamic relation in the institution of marriage. Your Honor, we'd ask the court to take judicial notice of DIX 1035. Very well. <clears throat> I'd like to switch gears, Professor, to, to talk a bit about uh, <clears throat> marriage and gender and then marriage and religion. First, uh, marriage uniquely and powerfully influences the way differences between the sexes are conveyed and symbolized, correct? I believe that has been true um, through most of our history, yes. So far as marriage is a public institution, it is the vehicle through which the apparatus of state can shape the gender order, correct? Yes. The whole system of attribution and meaning we call gender relies on and to a great extent derives from the structuring provided by marriage, correct? I wrote that. And you agree with it? <laughs> okay. And, and uh, gender matters. That is, it matters that human beings do not appear as neuter individuals, correct? Yes. Notions of gender are not constant but are specific to time and place, correct? What we attribute to gender specificity definitely is changing over time. But the gender binary of masculine and feminine is a basic classification in human thinking and appears in human usage in every culture, correct? We can't really think about human beings without implicitly seeing them in gendered form, correct? Yes. Okay. Now uh, let's turn to... Uh, the role of religion and its relationship to marriage in the United States. You said during direct that civil law has been supreme in the United States. Do you remember that? Invalidating marriages, yes. yes. Uh, from the founding of the United States to the present day, assumptions about the importance of marriage and its appropriate form have been deeply implanted in public policy, correct? Public authorities in the United States expected monogamy on a Christian model to prevail, correct? In the past, yes. And it did, correct? Yes, they, yes. A commitment to monogamous marriage on a Christian model was lodged deep in American political theory, correct? Yes. The great majority of colonists believed in basic tenets of Christian monogamy, correct? Yes. In the history of this country, both the church and the state have regulated marriage in the sense of instilling people with conscience about what are the appropriate behaviors in marriage, correct? Monogamy on a Christian model prevailed in part because of widespread Christian faith, correct? Yes. The particular form of monogamous marriage that is supposed to be lifelong and involve sexual faithfulness between the partners and economic mutual support, that form of marriage arose first as a result of Christianity, correct? That's a historical um, finding, yes, since in the ancient world, um, most everybody else was polygamous. Maybe you'll keep your voice up. It'll sure. be helpful. And, and one of the distinctive things about Jesus Christ and his apostles' teachings was to pursue a single partner in marriage and not multiple partners, correct? I know very little about Jesus Christ and his apostles. Well, you, you seem to know a little bit more during your deposition. Let's look at page 61 uh, of your deposition. It's behind tab one. Page reference, Council? Uh, page 61, line 5, Your Honor. And, and you said, Professor, when I asked you, what do you mean by Christian monogamy? Well, if we look back to the era of the origins of Christianity, which originated of, originated, of course, among Jews, Jews were apparently not at that time a monogamous people. Polygamy was accepted. And one of the distinctive things about Jesus Christ or his apostles' teaching was to pursue a single partner in marriage and not multiple partners. You stand by that testimony, right? I do, and I was using Jesus Christ or his apostles as a stand-in for the notion that this, this was a notion that began with Christianity. The 
enforceable initially, but it, it, it was an innovation is what I meant to imply here. The generation that founded the United States of America in 1789 subscribed to the basic tenets of Christian monogamy, correct? Yes, but again, I, I want to make it clear, since you're repeating my words outside of the larger context, that I'm using Christian monogamy there simply to emphasize that monogamy, uh, simply to emphasize monogamy, not to point to any other tenets of Christianity that might have been uh, embraced or not embraced. Are people. you saying that there is a difference between Christian monogamy and some other form of monogamy? No, I'm simply saying that monogamy in world history is attributable, so far as I am aware, to Christian precepts. The pre-Christian societies did not either require monogamy or uh, impose standards of monogamy. Is that what right. you're saying? As far as as far as I am aware, in the history of our own civilizations, uh, that that pre-Christian uh, and certainly. Uh, the early Middle Eastern uh, arenas where Christianity arose, those areas were, uh, were, were not restricted to the practice of monogamy, right? Talking and, about the Western world, I assume? Well, the, if we think of Western civilization and the Judeo-Christian ethic, that is broadly what characterizes our Western civilization. Christianity was what introduced a restriction to a single partner for life as the, the marital regime. And Professor, um, one of the basic tenets of Christian monogamy was that marriage was between a man and a woman, correct? That was assumed, yes. And to this day, large segments of Americans accept the Christian conception of sexual fidelity in marriage, correct? Yes. I, I do think the notion of sexual fidelity in marriage it, it goes beyond uh, Christianity. But yes, you could put it the way. I would agree with it the way you put it. In 1789, there were laws that prohibited brothers from marrying sisters, correct? Probably, yes. There have typically been um, restrictions on um, close familial association for marriage. And, and this law reflected a biblical tenet, correct? I can't say what it arose from. It could have arisen as equally from the common law. Well, I'd like to direct your attention to um, your deposition at page 136, line 25. 136, you said? 136, uh, Professor. And I asked you, what was the purpose that the prohibition on brothers marrying sisters, what purpose was served by that law? Various objections. Uh, yeah, I, I can't really comment on the purpose. I don't know the intentions, the purposeful intentions of the legislature's question. Do you know what the objective is of such laws? Uh, objection asked and answered calls for speculation. Answer, what was your question? The objective. Oh, the objective. To stop people from marrying close members of their family, clearly question. Well, that's tautological, but why wouldn't, you have, why wouldn't you have that objective? Ms. Baxter, objection, calls for speculation beyond the purpose of the port. Answer, well, I would simply say that this was a biblical tenet, that there were prohibited degrees of marriage, and while the biblical uh, pro prohibited degrees are very extensive, and interestingly, accordingly to a scholar of father-daughter incest, do not prevent the father from marrying his daughter. Uh, do you stand by your testimony? Well, as I said there, it, there were proscriptions and limits listed biblically about that, but I don't say here that it was clearly the, uh, the ground from which those legislative rulings arose. I, 
as I go on to say, uh, there, I mentioned the common law. Uh, frankly, I, I, I think there were multiple bases for the assumption that members of families should, um, th this was a restriction that the legislature thought was appropriate. In Massachusetts, Puritan religious values strongly infused the English tradition, yes or no? It's certainly in colonial Massachusetts. And Puritan ideology demanded fidelity of both partners, correct? Yes. From the 16th century through the 18th, Puritan reformers advocated chastity before marriage and fidelity, uh, after for men as well as women, correct? I say reformers? Are you reading my testimony or what? Well, I don't have to tell you oh. where you said it. Well, I mean, there weren't Puritan reformers. They were Puritans from the beginning. Puritans definitely believed in chastity before marriage and fidelity within it. That's clear. Yeah, there were differences between Puritan theory and canon law, correct? Puritans we, were radical Protestants. They did not believe uh, in the Catholic teachings. Or opening the door to the witness's testimony outside the United States. Well, I, I, th that is true. The 15th century Puritans, I, I would concede, uh, 16th century Puritans, she did write an article on the 16th century Puritans. No, so I did to that not. limited Sorry. extent. Oh, okay, well. I've let's, never dealt with the Puritans before the 17th century. Let, let's look at tab 24 of your binder, which is an article you wrote 34 years ago. Tab 24? Yes, Your Honor. And it's called Divorce and the Changing Status of Women in 18th Century Massachusetts. And let's turn to page 600. And in the second sentence, you said, from the 16th century through the 18th, Puritan reformers attacked the double standard. Ad, by advocating chastity before marriage and fidelity after for men as well as women. Does I'm that sorry, what, what page and what line are you S on? 600, second full sentence. Oh, well, I'm, I'm yeah, actually talking about um, Puritans in, uh, in England because there weren't any Puritans in Massachusetts in the 16th century. Uh, yeah, well, it's a general comment that right, uh, it's hardly, <laughs> hardly an article about Puritans in the 16th century. It's half of one line in a 30-page article. <laughs> well, well, let's uh, take, you would concede that there are differences between Puritan theory and canon law in 18th century Massachusetts, correct? Particularly with regard to divorce, which was the subject of this article. Yeah, and uh, under canon law, uh, desertion was not even grounds for separate bed and board unless it was combined with cruelty. Is that correct? Gosh, Mr. Thompson, I haven't worked on this since the mid-1970s. I have to refresh my own memory about that, these matters. That, that would be fine. Let's, let's do that together. Turn to page 608, if you would. And, and you wrote, and we, we can look at this together, and I'll just read it, and you can let me know if you stand by this or whether you're research has changed your thinking on this, but uh, on page 608, fourth line down, in Puritan theory, desertion warranted divorce. Under canon law, on the contrary, desertion was not even grounds for separate bed and board unless it was combined with cruelty. Accepting the Ferry and Fletcher cases, the governor and council acted as though canon law controlled their decisions on desertion. Does that reflect, refresh your recollection that there were instances in which in Massachusetts the governor acted as though canon law were controlling? I'm, I'm afraid that you misinterpret my comment there to mean that I literally thought they were following canon law. This was simply an artful way of saying they did not grant uh, divorces on the basis of desertion unless cruelty accompanied it. it. The intent, of course, I took this from another secondary source, Howard's Matrimonial Institutions, but my point was simply that they were enforcing a stricter, uh, a stricter standard for separation from bed and board. It didn't, didn't mean they were reading canon law and 
following it because they were uh, canon law specialists. Well, and turning to the, the first sentence of the next paragraph where you say canon law rather than Puritan precept appears to have guided the decisions in cruelty cases as well. I, I guess so. I guess I thought so then from the research that I was doing. And you stand I, by that, correct? I, I, I can't redo the research on the stand here, so I have no reason to think that what I said there was mistaken. Although the authorities may have changed, I was citing, I was citing um, a book, Howard's Matrimonial Institutions, that was written quite a while before that. I think in the early 20th century, it was a summary of various colonial laws on divorce. Since the 1970s, a, a lot more work has been done on colonial divorce, and it's not an issue that I've returned to in my research in a detailed way. So. I, I can't say with absolute uh, certainty that, in my scholarly opinion, this is still correct because I, I haven't done the detailed research that would enable me to, uh, to affirm that with, with great confidence. At the time of the founding, there was a broadly shared understanding of the essentials of the institution of marriage, correct? Broadly shared, uh, what, what was the word? At the time of the founding, there was a broadly shared understanding of the essentials yes. of the institution of marriage. Yes, I agree. The most important was the unity of husband and wife, correct? Yes, by unity I meant the doctrine of coverture, as I was discussing earlier. In the 19th century, the Christian religious background of marriage was unquestionably present and prominent, correct? In definitions of marriage, in uncommon understandings of marriage, yes. The, the Christian religious background of marriage was adopted in and filtered through legislation, correct? That is correct, if you understand me to mean that Christian background in the very basic sense of its being monogamous, ideally lifelong, and uh, entailing sexual fidelity, yes. And by the end of the 19th century, there was an alliance between national authority and Christian monogamous morale, morality settled firmly in place, is that correct? Well, I made that comment with respect to the long campaign that federal authorities took against polygamy as it was being practiced in Utah by the Mormons. The single standard that the national authorities wanted to enforce was that of monogamy, and they had also supported it with respect to trying to support the marriages of emancipated slaves in the immediate post-Civil War period. In a general sense, the social meaning of marriage did not greatly change from 1789 to 1868, correct? There was actually a lot of legal change in the 15 years after the Civil War, correct? With respect to the laws barring marriage across the color line, yes, there was a lot of change. And there were challenges to the prohibitions on marriages between blacks and whites in those years, correct? Yes, on the basis of contractual freedom of the parties to marry. And some of those challenges were successful, at least temporarily, correct? Very briefly, in states that were controlled by black legislators. In the 19th century, many Americans engaged in informal marriages, correct? That is true. And pregnancy or childbirth was the signal for a couple to consider themselves married, correct? Not always. Sometimes. Well, let's look at uh, Public Vows, your book, which has been admitted. Page 31, it appears uh, behind tab 31 in your binder. <clears throat> 31, you said? Uh, page 31, and it's the last paragraph. Part. Informal practices continued as white immigrants fanned out to the South and West. Marriage frequently followed upon a sexual relationship between and a and man and a woman. That may be a typo. Is that a typo in the book? Yes, I think you're right. <laughs> okay. Uh, between a man and a woman proving fruitful rather than proceeding it. Pregnancy or childbirth was the signal 
for a couple to consider themselves married. You believe that when you wrote these words, didn't you? Well, as I said, frequently, yes. The, this part of the sentence that uh, follows the, the colon also incorporates that frequently adverbs. I'm saying, yes, it often was, not always. One recent change in marriage has been the emergence of covenant marriage in certain states, correct? I'm aware that it exists. Do you know how many states have covenant marriages? I believe it's two. Uh, which states? Louisiana and uh, Arkansas, I think. Any others? Okay. And covenant marriage represents a change in the institution of marriage in Louisiana and Arkansas, correct? I'm not, I, 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 my understanding was that it provided an alternative sort of marriage to what had been available before covenant was authorized. And in that sense, well, an additional form of marriage. And in that sense, it's a change to the institution of marriage to give couples that option, correct? About how much of a change it is. It seemed to me the covenant marriage was more a restriction that the couple placed upon themselves by deciding for that option rather than the standard option. But the, what is covenant marriage? Uh, as I understand it, I, I think the couple pledges never to divorce, but I, <coughs> uh, they pledge never to divorce. <coughs> they, is that what it is? Well, <laughs> you're, you're the expert. Well, no, I mean, this is something that's happened in just the past few years that I didn't, I, I think it hadn't even happened when I wrote my book and I never really followed up on it since I didn't see it as a major, I don't know, I just didn't follow up on it. So I, I, my sense was that it was harder to get out of a covenant marriage than a standard marriage, and that was what states had done. Provide an option for, for spouses to say, I want to join this even firmer commitment. And then the state would enforce that decision, correct? Well, I assume so in making it harder for them to divorce if, if that, I, I don't know what the specific provisions of covenant marriage are or whether there are any punitive measures of enforcement or exactly, I don't know how it's enforced. The legislation that inspired covenant marriage in, in Louisiana reflected Christian moral principles, is that right? I don't know. Now, you've reviewed the uh, congressional testimony surrounding the Defense of Marriage Act in connection with writing your book, is that right? Not all of it, but a bunch of it, yes. And, and congressional debate on the Defense of Marriage Act reiterated long-lived official insistence on traditional marriage as a necessary pillar of the nation, correct? Yes, many of the proponents of the Defense of Marriage Act did. Did any of the proponents of the Defense of Marriage Act explain their support for the legislation by reference to their religious convictions? I don't recall. You've read Edmund Burke's reflection on the French Revolution, haven't you? If I did, it was an awfully long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> do you know whether, whether you read it or not, do you know that one of the things Edmund Burke emphasized was a respect for tradition in that work? I really can't say. Do you, do you know whether any of the supporters of the Defense of Marriage Act supported the legislation because of a respect for tradition? I assume they did. I think that could be inferred. Did you find evidence in the historical record suggesting that each and every supporter of the Defense of Marriage Act did so because of moral disapproval of gays and lesbians? I don't know. In the United States, a state has never prevented a man who is homosexually oriented from marrying a woman who herself is homosexually oriented, correct? That is correct so far as I know. And it's definitely happened that a gay man has married a lesbian, correct? That's happened. And so in that sense, sexual orientation is not literally what the law is prescribing in marriage, correct? Objection or rule. Well, the man and the woman were able to marry, so that's, that's all I can say. Well, let's look at what you said during your Iowa deposition, tab two, uh, page 52. 
My Iowa deposition is which tab? Tab two. Oh, tab two. Somehow I'm only getting tab 35. I must be reversed. Tab two. Page what? 52. Okay. Okay. So if we look at, uh, start at line 13, uh, you were asked, if you take sexual orientation out of the equation then, can you think of any reason the state may not want to permit two heterosexual men to marry each other? Answer. Let me just answer your question in another way. Another way to illustrate the point I was making about how that I was being literal is that the state has never prevented a man who is actually homosexually oriented from marrying a woman who herself is homosexually oriented. That is, that has definitely happened, that a gay man has married a lesbian. The state has never prevented that. So in that sense, sexual orientation is not literally what the law is prescribing in marriage. And you stand by that testimony, correct? I do. Okay. Uh, now, let's turn to uh, the uh, history of California and marriage. And, and when did California become a state? One, somewhere in there. <laughs> I think the first constitution was 51, but the state may have been admitted the year before. Uh, in California, in 1851, it was simply assumed that marriage would be between a man and a woman, correct? I would say so. And the overwhelming reason why it was assumed was because marriage had long been practiced in that form, correct? Yes. And coverture was a creation of the English common law, correct? That's right. California laws, California's laws in 1851 were not derived from English common law, correct? The laws of domestic relations, you mean, specifically? Yes. Uh, they were certainly influenced by the civil law, but common law uh, preconceptions and practices uh, about marital roles were uh, incorporated into that. They were not absent from California domestic relations law, despite In its civil law. Um, in those common law states that maintained coverture, coverture was a bargain in which each spouse had a very important role the state enforced, correct? Yes. Coverture would not have existed as long as it did were it not a bargain that was seen by those who participated in it as reciprocal, as having something in it for both parties, correct? Correct. While coverture was in place, there were no statutes that ever said that only the husband can work and the wife can't, correct? Uh, what do you mean by work? Work for pay? Uh, let's take work for pay. There was never a law that said a woman couldn't work for pay. That's correct, but under coverture, her wages would go to her husband. She wouldn't own them. Under coverture, a woman's personal and real property, whether acquired before or after the marriage, immediately became the property of her husband, correct? Yes. But that was never the case in California, correct? Under community property, the wife retained title to her property, but the husband was, upon the marriage, the manager of that property and had the right to dispose of it and make the decisions so that the asymmetry of marital roles was still very much a part of the California community property system. But by the time California became a state, coverture had already been significantly broken into by married women's property laws in various states, correct? Significantly, but not um, not in such a way as to eviscerate by any means the institution. Simply that in, in many states by 1850, although not that many by 1850, more by 1860, uh, married women had formal title to their property, but all of the other elements of coverture remained very much in place. By the time California became a state, coverture had already been, uh, excuse me, uh, before California became a state, the people of California were governed by Spanish law, correct? Or precisely, I assume so. It was you know, before 1848, before the war, Mexico uh, uh, had 
the property, and so I don't know exactly what governed between 1848 and 1850. I, I guess it was part of a U.S. territory. All right, and, and, and just so the record's clear, under civil law, coverture did not exist, correct? Coverture as such did not, but I don't think we should assume that that meant uh, a vast difference in terms of the understanding of marriage as dictating quite different spousal roles, quite, quite asymmetrical spousal roles. Federal courts had very little role in the dismantling of coverture, correct? That is correct. Fairly early in California's history, there were uh, legal acknowledgments that a married woman had the right to keep her own property, correct? Yes, it was fairly early. Now, now let's talk about the social meaning of marriage, uh, which is a term you used uh, in your book and in your report. When you use the term social meaning of marriage, you're referring to how the public views marriage, correct? Yes, general societal understandings. And you, uh, it's your understanding that there's a very, very high proportion of people who believe that the time to get married is when you want to have children, correct? That's generally true of heterosexual couples, yes. Uh, is it different for homosexual couples? I think the question would be more um, variable for I, mean, I, I don't have any data since same-sex couples have not been able to marry when it is they make the choice to marry. Marriage has evolved into a civil institution through which the state formally recognizes and ennobles individuals' choices to enter into long-term, committed, intimate relationships, correct? Yes. But there's no requirement in law that a person who wishes to get married actually intend to have a long-term relationship, correct? I don't think that marriage licensors inquire into intentions. I think that's accurate. Mutual love has always been a part of the social meaning of marriage in the United States, correct? Part of the social meaning, never a precise requisite for entering the institution, but part of the social meaning indeed. Yeah, but there's never been a legal requirement that people be in love to get married, correct? Not at all. Marriage, in your opinion, is a status which implies one's having grown up. Is that correct? I think that is part of the social meaning, that it is seen as a mark of adulthood settling down. Uh, another social meaning of marriage has been that it is the way to found a household, <clears throat> a living unit that is an economic partnership and that involves a commitment to one's partner, correct? Yes. Marriage also has a whole set of romantic meanings for people, correct? Yes. And this is, the, this is broadcast to us all the time in our public culture, correct? Yes. So the public culture has an impact on the social meaning of marriage, correct? Yes, it does. The social meaning of marriage unquestionably has real-world consequences, correct? Social meaning exists in the real world, yes. And just so the record's clear, the social meaning of marriage unquestionably has real-world consequences, yes or no? Yes. But it is far easier to say that the social meaning of marriage has consequences than to measure the consequences, correct? Yes. <laughs> For the generality of people, the social meanings of marriage are highly influential in their own personal views of the institution, correct? Yes. One way the social meaning of marriage changes is through actual social practices, correct? Yes. Another way the social meaning of marriage changes is through economic transformations, correct? Economic transformations have a great impact on the social meaning of marriage, yes. Another way the social meaning of marriage changes is through ideas and ideology, correct? Things are all bound up together, yes. So that's a yes? Uh, there are also technological reasons why the social meaning of marriage changes, correct? Yes, specifically with 
with respect to the technology of birth control and other reproductive technologies. And law very definitely has an impact on the social meaning of marriage, correct? Yes. How a given person thinks about gay marriage, their own or others, it's usually quite affected by quite small scale factors, how they were brought up, who their friends are, what their religion is, what they have observed, and their own personal experience, correct? Yes. Now let me ask you some questions about the state of marriage today. In, in your opinion, morality has been uncoupled from marriage, correct? If, if you're quoting my work there, uh, that was a, a statement made in a context in which I made the point that whereas in the past, uh, adultery and fornication were crimes that were punished by the state, that the state enforced those morally disapproved uh, uh, actions that support, uh, in support of marriage and in support of uh, making marriage the only licensed legitimate place where sex could take place. Uh, and the, I think what I was describing in making that claim about morality being uncoupled was that um, we have a much broader and more flexible set of social mores about sex, marriage, and morality uh, in the past couple of generations so that state regulations about marriage are no longer, and state enforcement of regulations are no longer principally interested in punishing sex that takes place outside of marriage. Rather, marriage is upheld for other forms of social good and not the seen to be moral goods that it, it, it was a principal conveyor of um, in the past. Morality, particularly with regard to sexual behavior. The public forgiveness of President Clinton's sexual misadventures can only be understood against the background of a generation's seismic shift in marriage practices, correct? Yes, I was referring there to the fact that, that the public tended to, at least a majority of the public, did, did not uh, uh, topple President Clinton from the presidency, even though his infidelities were made public because, I argued, the, um, the social meaning of marriage had moved toward assuming that spouses themselves are the best ones to decide on what is appropriate behavior within the marriage so that the public tended to see this as a matter between Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton and not a matter that what was something the state should judge. Your Honor, I would request that the witness be instructed to answer the questions yes or no rather than give these long uh, speeches. Well, I think you got an answer. I got an answer, all right. Uh, Follow up on it. But, okay. uh, I don't know that we need to go into Bill and Hillary Clinton That's in, right. in any great depth. <laughs> okay. Uh, at the 20th century's close, marriage could no longer be considered a predictable venture. Is that correct? That's correct. Marriage in part, marriage laws in part reflect concerns about population size, correct? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Sure. Uh, marriage laws uh, in part reflect concerns about population size. It's certainly a potential, yes, of marriage laws to be concerned about that. The alteration in the relationship between marriage and the state might be called disestablishment, correct? Yes or no? As a heuristic device, yes, it might. In, in the history of religion, the term disestablishment is sometimes used, correct? It is a descriptive term in the history of religion. In some countries, there is an established religion, and the ending of that special status is called disestablishment, correct? Yes. Disestablishment did not mean that religious institutions disappeared, correct? On the contrary, the consequence more often of disestablishment was that religious sects proliferated, and no single model was any longer supported and enforced by the state, correct? Yes. By analogy, one could argue that the particular model of marriage, which was for so long the officially supported one, has been disestablished, correct? One could argue. Today, plural marriages have bloomed, in your opinion, correct? 
Illegally, yes. And, in fact, uh, in your opinion, marriage is now understood as a private choice today, correct? Choice whether to marry or not marry is understood as a private choice, yes. This stance has allowed hundreds and perhaps thousands of individuals to revive polygamy, correct? I don't think it's that that has allowed it. Well, let's look at what you wrote in Public Vows, uh, page 213, tab uh, 31. I Page reference, Council? Uh, 213, Your Honor, uh, tab 31. Page, I'm sorry, tell me the page again, please. Uh, 213. And you wrote in the first full paragraph in the second sentence, couples who are not following the conventional model look for endorsement from like-minded communities and expect to be left alone by others whom they are not harming since marriage is understood as a private choice. This stance has allowed hundreds and perhaps thousands of fundamentalist Mormons in Utah and Arizona to revive polygamy. Do you stand by that statement? By this observation, yes. Okay. And the emergence uh, in politics of the new right responded in part to the apparent disestablishment of traditional marriage, correct? Yes. The new right makes a connection between the stability of conventional model of monogamy and the health of the nation, correct? Yes. But in your opinion, the resistance to same-sex marriage shows that the profound transformation of disestablishment has not taken place, correct? Yes. In fact, despite sweeping reformulations and intimate relations in the past quarter century, one can doubt whether most Americans' common sense about marriage has vastly changed. Correct. What, what is, yes, I think that's correct. Uh, congressional rhetoric on behalf of the Defense of Marriage Act undercut the idea that disestablishment of the traditional institution of marriage was well underway, correct? Yes. The bill's supporters announced that traditional marriage was the fundamental building block of society, correct? They did. The bill's supporters also announced that nature and the Judeo Christian moral tradition commanded or comported with traditional heterosexual marriage, correct? The bill's supporters maintained that traditional heterosexual marriage was the basis of civilization, correct? They did. Congressman James Talent of Missouri uh, declared it is an act of hubris to believe that marriage can be infinitely malleable, that it can be pushed and pulled around like silly putty without destroying its essential stability. He added, marriage goes, then the family goes, and if the family goes, we have none of the decency or ordered liberty which Americans have been brought up to enjoy and to appreciate. And this pretty well summed up the predominant view among the bill's supporters, correct? And marriage is not an infinitely elastic contract between two people, correct? I can't answer that question. Well, let's look at the amicus brief that you signed on to, uh, which appears behind tab 25. This is the amicus brief that was submitted to the uh, Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts. And, and you were a signatory to that brief, is that correct? Let me look. This is the historian's brief? Uh, yes, of the professors of history of marriage. Yes, I did sign this brief. Okay, and then let's turn to page 32. And the first sentence says, 20th century courts have made clear that marriage is not an infinitely elastic contract between two people. Do you agree with that statement? Okay. Yes, I'll agree with it. It's right. not infinitely elastic. 
Congressman Talent, in the comments I just read, voiced a tension that had been present ever since legislators began altering the terms of marriage in the 1840s, correct? Yes. And during the debate on the Defense of Marriage Act, uh, the fear was expressed that licensing same-sex marriage would start a slippery slope to licensing polygamy, correct? It was. Now, while you were at Harvard, you've taught a class entitled Men, Women, and Marriage, is that right? Yes, I did. And uh, you taught that class in 2006 or 7, is that right? That sounds about right. And in that class, you assigned some selections from a collection that Andrew Sullivan had put together that were documents uh, relating to the same-sex marriage controversy, is that correct? That sounds right. Your Honor, we'd like to move the admission or ask the court to take judicial notice of DIX 1032. We've provided copies uh, to uh, plaintiffs uh, prior to trial and to the court. 1032. Maybe you can connect that up to uh, the witness. Yes. Did you know of a better uh, collection of, if someone wanted to look at the arguments for and against same-sex marriage as a policy matter, not as a legal matter. Do you know of a better resource that captures fairly and accurately all of the different points of views than Andrew Sullivan's book? I, I can't answer that. I know I chose it at the time because it was convenient. I signed a few documents within it. It was handy. I, I can't say that it's the best rendition of pro and con ideas. No, I, I can't affirm that. Well, can you name one that's better? It's not a type of anthology I've researched lately, so I, I just don't have the wherewithal to answer that. Okay, but it, when you were teaching your class at Harvard, you thought I it thought was... I thought it was adequate. Whether it was the best, I can't say. I see. And in your class, you focused on the extent to which opposition to same-sex marriage seems to have been rooted in a fear of gender differentiation disappearing. Is that right? In a, in a single lecture in the class, I, uh, I believe I raised that as a theory of why opposition ran so deep. And um, you, you've testified before the Vermont or provided a statement to the Vermont legislature when it was uh, considering same-sex marriage? Not exactly. Uh, well, in the aftermath of the uh, ruling of the Vermont Supreme Court requiring either civil unions or same-sex marriage, you provided uh, some input. Is that right? Not to the legislature, to, a, to their joint judiciary committee. And when so it was a committee of the yes. legislature. I see of both houses. I see. When when you testified or provided that statement in Vermont, the law that resulted was a compromise, which gave something to the Catholics and other conservative groups and something to the LGBT community. Correct. It did state in its first uh, line marriages between a man and a woman, and then it went on to grant a civil union arrangement that gave all the rights and benefits to same-sex couples, yes. And, and all of your teaching involves uh, political history to some degree, correct? It does. And the concept of political power is relevant to your classes, correct? Yes. And you define political power as the capability to have one's wishes effectuated, correct? In the political sphere, yes. Now, you believe that there are changed circumstances that have, uh, th that support uh, extending marriage to same-sex couples, correct? I do. And in the 19th century, marriage was confined to a man and a woman and not extended to same-sex couples as a matter of tradition, correct? I don't believe anyone ever pressed for marriage uh, any same any couple of the same sex ever pressed for marriage so the question was never defended so it was marriage was maintain, maintained between a man and a woman in the 19th century as a matter of tradition correct of custom yes and at that time the homosexual as a person had not really been recognized as such correct correct it was 
homosexual acts were recognized, but not the attribution of a different kind of personhood to someone because he or she uh, had homosexual desire or practiced homosexual acts. It wasn't until the 20th century when sexuality as a mode of defining the very self of the person really came into the fore, correct? Yes. And by the time, by the term homosexual today, you understand that term to mean a person who is erotically desirous of members of the same sex, correct? Yes. And that's a big difference from the 19th century, where gender presentation ruled interpretation of a person's behavior, not his desire, correct? We have an objection. Oh. Objection, I just wanted to, to have clarification as to whether counsel's talking about within the United States, these customs, or is he talking more broadly? He's been jumping around a little bit. Oh, in the United States. That's my questions today are pertain to that. Very well. Can you? Yes, I think speaking in, in broad scale that one can say that from centuries past when a person was judged by whether he looked masculine or she looked feminine, uh, there has been a shift from that being the principal way of identifying someone's sexuality to uh, recognizing desire and um, desire and, and motivation toward uh, toward another individual is it for an individual of the same sex or an individual of the other sex this is more definitive today in medical psychological social and cultural meanings of sexuality in your opinion there are uh, excuse me uh, one changing circumstance uh, is acceptance of homosexuality and the recognition that discrimination against homosexuals uh, is a form of discrimination and not simply a moral behavior, correct? What, what was the beginning of the, that long question? Well, we're talking about the changed circumstances which you believe support extending the institution of marriage to same-sex couples and one of those uh, change circumstances is the recognition, in your opinion, that discrimination against homosexuals is a form of discrimination, in fact, and not just a moral behavior, correct? Yes. Right. And there is considerable social survey evidence showing that among the young, discrimination against homosexuals is much less than it was in the past century, correct? Yes. And another one of these changing circumstances is men's and women's gender roles that have made them, uh, while not completely fungible, much more duplicative of, the, of one another in many arenas of life, correct? Yes. And in your opinion, these things together make up a series of changing circumstances that make same-sex marriage a very reasonable proposition, in fact, a very reasonable thing to enact, correct? Yes. Now, uh, let me ask you about gender differences. Uh, you're familiar with the concept of sex ratio, by which I mean the relative proportion of men and women in a given society? Yes. And you're perfectly willing to grant that there might well be different rules when there's a scarcity of women as opposed to a scarcity of men, correct? Different state rules or different customs? I'm not sure what you mean. D different customs. Different customs, yeah. And in fact, it's highly likely there would be difference in rules pertaining to sexual relations in a community where you had a relative scarcity of men as opposed to a community where you had a relative scarcity of women, correct? It's a reasonable hypothesis. All right, now let's turn to no-fault divorce. Uh, the innovation of no-fault divorce indicated a major shift, correct? Yes. The provision of divorce on more and more grounds has certainly changed marriage and changed people's expectations of marriage, correct? Yes, this has been a long process beginning in the 19th century, the provision of more grounds, and no fault uh, moved that significantly in the direction of letting the spouses themselves decide on the grounds. You can't identify in any complete way the effect of no-fault divorce, correct? I think that's correct. And if you were attempting to assess whether no-fault divorce changed the relative standing of men and women within marriages that persisted, it would be extremely hard to discern the answer to that question, correct? Objection, Your Honor. They confuse 
a little vague. Maybe you can sharpen it up. Well, let me see if I'm quoting her or I'm quoting my bad question at the deposition. Um, it was page uh, 174 of the deposition. Let me just uh, do it this way, uh, Professor. Um, would you agree uh, that uh, from a societal perspective generally, uh, no fault divorce changed the relative standing of men and women within marriage? I don't know. I, I don't know. Okay, very well. Uh, do you uh, believe that behavior is really infinitely malleable by social circumstances and by culture? About infinitely, yes. With the sole exception of self-preservation? I have to accept that. Your Honor, may I consult with my colleagues for a brief moment? I think we're finished. But... Well, you may do so. <clears throat> Your Honor, we, we have no further questions. Thank you, Professor. Very well. Mr. Boutrous, uh, any redirect? Yes, Your Honor. Professor Cott, um, Mr. Thompson asked you some questions about your personal views of the issue of whether individuals of the same gender should be able to marry. And I'd like to ask you a couple of questions on that, too. Um, first, when you began your research uh, in connection with public vows and your inquiry into the history of marriage in the United States, I guess it was back in 1990, um, had you formed a view on whether um, same-sex marriage should be authorized or whether it was a uh, constitutionally permissible? I hadn't formed a view. And what, um, what led you to the view that you hold today that, that concerning same-sex marriage? It really was the research and thinking I did in uh, writing the book. And initially, what um, the advocacy of um, for marriage to be uh, allowed to same-sex couples. What that advocacy did, because it was going on beginning at the time, was to point me toward the, the great importance of the state uh, in creating marriages and defining marriages. And so it was a goad to my whole approach to focus on public vows. But uh, I was really motivated to write the book because of my interest in uh, the gender order between how men and women have understood their roles in society privately and publicly. And I was most interested in how marriage has been a vehicle for shaping that. But it was through the, uh, through the period of the research and the writing that I learned a lot more about the history of marriage and particularly about the ways that marriage laws had been used punitively. I was, this was the, really a great shock to me, <laughs> just how repeatedly with different groups, like Native Americans and blacks, of course, and then Asians, and then women who made the bad choice to marry someone who was not uh, an American at a certain period of time, the period of high immigration. I was, I was really amazed at how these laws were used punitively and restrictively, yet most of those restrictions had been gradually seen to be uh, a, a, a bar on liberty and had been dismantled. And uh, this fed into my thinking about the question of marriage for couples of the same sex. 
and also my research on the extent to which the state, as the third party to the bargain of marriage, had entered into the business of prescribing spousal roles. And so that history was very clear what direction it had moved in, that the state had moved uh, more and more out of that, allowing the couple involved in, in choosing one another and forming a marriage and household to, to decide themselves how they would allocate their respective uh, duties. And so it's those, it was those things I came to see that m moved me very solidly into the direction of first supporting the right of couples of the same sex to marry simply because I think it is a civil right to marry the partner of your choice. But, um, if your historical research during that period had led you to conclude that history and tradition in the United States and the changes in, in our history did not su support the uh, uh, elimination of barriers to individuals of the same sex marrying. Would you be here today testifying in support of the plaintiffs? I don't think so. But <laughs> I, I, another thing I might mention is that in studying this history, I was also really struck with the extent to which marriage has not been one thing, that it is a flexible institution. And in fact, what we, uh, the fact that it is so alive and vigorous today and so desirable a status and that couples of the same sex want to enter it is testimony to how far it has not been one static thing over time, that it has shed its attributes of inequality and it has shed most restrictions to entering this honored institution. And um, I sometimes think of it as rather like our U.S. Constitution, that it, it has certain essentials that remain the same, but it has been altered to adjust to changing circumstances so that it remains a very alive and, and vigorous institution today. Let me ask you about the elimination of the racial restrictions, coverture, the other discriminatory prohibitions you talked about. Did the elimination of those barriers to marriage change the social meaning of marriage? I think they changed it in a very positive direction. And this is, was particularly evident in uh, the 1960s, 70s period of social turmoil over marriage as among as about many other things, and then the period after, in that um, there was a great deal of, um, of negative sentiment voiced about the institution of marriage in the 1970s, and many alternatives to marriage then, like swinging, and these were all among heterosexuals, but open marriage, many, many complaints about the injustices embodied in the institution of marriage and the ways that there ought to be um, alternatives to it that would be socially approved. And after that, um, there, since then, I would say, particularly in the 80s and 90s, both because of groups on the right, like Focus on the Family, who have stressed all the benefits and advantages to society and individuals of marriage, and also, importantly, because of the advocacy of same-sex couples to enter the institution, I think in the past 20 to 25 years that we don't see a critical perspective on marriage as the principal thing looming in its social meaning. We see a very highly valued and honored um, uh, set of expectations about the institution. And so I, I think this, this, this is another suggestion that by uh, clearing away from the marriage institution its aspects of restriction and regulation and emphasizing the liberty aspects, the creation of a zone of intimacy that the partners choose, um, that these emphases within marriage and in the state's prescription of what marriage is have helped to, to um, give it new reverence in recent years as compared to, say, 40, 50 years ago when it was really under fire. What did you mean uh, in, in your book, Public Vows, when you spoke about this concept of disestablishment that Mr. Thompson raised with you a moment ago? Well, I was using it as a heuristic device or uh, a framework for thinking about research. 
and suggesting, as I said in answer to him, that there might be an analogy to the disestablishment of religion, which was not bad for religion. It actually was quite good for religion in that many sects like the Methodists and Baptists and so on were able to flourish in addition to the standard Presbyterians and Congregationalists and so on. Um, and what I really meant was that the established marriage that I had been tracking over 200 years in American history was that one that prescribed spousal roles, that um, put strong, bright lines of morality between extramarital relationships and marital relationships, um, and that imposed certain restrictions on access. And disestablishment would be to give a more flexible um, an amplified um, definition for the institution. However, I, I, I did say that when one looked at, I was looking at the national scene, so I looked at the Defense of Marriage Act and the, the strong um, prescription in the Defense of Marriage Act that marriage was only between a man and a woman, certainly made it clear that that uh, feature of marriage was still very much established. And there was another federal law, the Personal Responsibility and Work Act at the same time, which also put tremendous um, emphasis on marriage in, in a somewhat backward looking way, that marriage uh, was the way for a woman to be supported by her husband, and that it was a very desirable um, institution in society for that reason. It seemed to go back on um, the, uh, the, the law, the constitutional law about gender asymmetry in, I'm sorry, about the gender symmetry and equality in the marital relationship. But at any rate, I, I did conclude that the, uh, the state's involvement in marriage, I think, is salutary. The question is, what is that investment going to be, and what are those definitions going to be? And I think that judging on the basis of the history, that an amplified understanding of the institution and what it can successfully um, um, accept, including the marriage of a couple of the same sex, seem to me uh, very reasonable to assent to. Now, Mr. Thompson showed you, I believe it was under tab 18, the article by his own expert, uh, Mr. Blankenhorn, at, in the Los uh, Angeles Times. Uh, there that. was something by Blankenhorn, I know, I don't know what, yes, he, he, it is number uh, 18. And you'll recall from your work in this case, Mr. Blankenhorn has used the phrase deinstitutionalization. You recall that? Yes. And is disestablishment, the way you use the term, the same thing as deinstitutionalization, as you understand Mr. Blankenhorn to be using that term? I'm very puzzled by what is meant by deinstitutionalization in his usages but I feel pretty sure that it is not what I mean by disestablishment, which, first of all, was not, it was, a, as I said, a, a framework for thinking about what change has been. And, and, um, in, the cor in, in the course of reviewing Mr. Blankenhorn's work and his statements, did you form any opinions about his methodology and his uh, conclusions? I, I would say yes, I did have some assessments of his, uh, of his overall, um, if not his method, which is unclear, uh, of his conclusions and, and of, his, of, of the concerns that he brings forward. Because it seems to me that insofar as I understand deinstitutionalization as, a, as uh, something he posits as extremely negative, that it is a, um, it is to render changes that have happened in the history of marriage that have preceded and have been um, brought about by things other than the advocacy for same-sex marriage. That is, there has been since the 1960s a uh, rising, there was a steeply rising divorce rate in the, in the 60s in the United States. There, uh, since the 60s we have seen fewer couples marrying, uh, and there has been an, uh, an increase in births out, out of wedlock. But these, these seem to me the, the, the worrisome things that Mr. Blankenhorn would put under the category of deinstitutionalization. And I want to make a larger 
uh, you know, a, a historical observation there. Between 1965 and 1980, not only in the United States, but in all the industrialized world from Europe to Japan, these indicators, the rate at which people married, the rate at which people divorced, one sank, one, you know, one rose, and the rate of out of wedlock pregnancies. These underwent very, very sharp shifts in all these countries within the space of 15 years. It was a true demographic and cultural uh, watershed and turning point in the history of the industrialized world in which, as I, and I'm citing the authority of a French demographer, Pierre Roussel, on this, that it um, was, he, he called it the banalization of previous mores. That is, things that had formerly been thought outside the pale of respectability became respectable, acceptable, not worthy of comment among middle class people. And it uh, was that shift that I think uh, is really behind the concerns that Professor Blankenhorn brings forward. And these shifts, which have actually moderated since 1980, none of these indicators has continued to go up at the rate that it did suddenly zoom up, I mean the bad indicators, you know, at the rate uh, as it did between 65 and 80. The, the divorce rate, in fact, in the United States, the rate of increase in the divorce rate plateaued in 1981. And while divorces continue, the numbers continue to rise, the rate of increase of divorce has plateaued for 25 years. Um, so the question of same-sex marriage, I think, is quite separate from the kinds of concerns about what I understand Mr. Blankenhorn to be concerned about with respect to deinstitutionalization. I think it has more to do with changes that have occurred in heterosexual mores about love and sex outside of marriage than it does to do with the question of same-sex couples wanting to enter the marriage institution and gain its stability and its formal imprimatur. Mr. Thompson um, pointed you to page 199 of your deposition, which is under tab one. I'd like you to turn to that if you would. And beginning on line two, where he asked you the question about the Massachusetts divorce rates. Oh, yes. You, yes. you, you uh, were not allowed to give the context and the full meaning of what you meant there. Could you do that now? Well, it really relates exactly to what I just said in that I, um, I, I think that the divorce rate question is, is very hard to answer in a period of simply five years, that, which is all there has been same-sex marriage in Massachusetts. And, and that's why I, would, uh, I, I, I simply couldn't make a claim about that relation. But the, the divorce rate question is a long-term trend. Now, uh, since we're talking about divorce, what in your view is the relevance of the, the no-fault divorce movement that swept the nation, the United States, um, in terms of the analysis of the issues in this case, in the Perry case? I think it's uh, very clearly that the passage of no-fault divorce here, starting in California, of course, which was the first state, and then sweeping through the states, and as well becoming the characteristic form of divorce in Europe. Um, is, was an indication of the shift in, um, in weight from the state to the couple with respect to the terms of, of, of marital performance. That, as I've said, spousal roles used to be dictated by the state. Now they're dictated by the couple themselves. There's no requirement that they do X or Y if they're one spouse or the other. And Similarly with divorce, that under the adversary regime that preceded the no-fault dispensation, one spouse had to accuse the other of a fault that the state had defined as the reason a marriage could be ended. And that led to, in that was behind the times, in that many couples by the 20th century both knew that their marriage had broken down. One of them may not have committed the fault that the state defined, particularly in the state of New York, which only had the ground of adultery, and of course is a very large and influential state. And uh, so couples would collude to present a fault before the court. And this was uh, the movement for no-fault divorce was in fact started by lawyers who thought this was very bad for the law. 
that people should be colluding and their lawyers should be colluding with them. So no fault divorce really set into uh, actual practice what had been happening to a great extent behind the shadow of the adversary regime. And it represented that the state was no longer so interested in saying, okay, this is, uh, this is what breaks up a marriage, or if you're a husband, you have to do this. If you're a wife, you have to do that. And it, that move um, it, it underlines the fact that, that gender asymmetry, that specific performance of one marital role or another is not what uh, is in the law of marriage these days and seems to me to open the door to um, the appropriateness of a same-sex couple getting married. Does it reinforce that trend that you mentioned earlier relating to uh, mutual consent and, and choice in terms of the person to whom you would be married? Yes, in respect that the mutual consent and choice about the marriage ending is now part of the no-fault um, dispensation. And no-fault divorce swept the nation. Were there alarm bells sounded concerning the effect that might have on the institution of marriage in this country? I think at the time, there were so many alarms raised about marriage between 1965 and 1980 that I'm not sure I could separate out the particular alarms by no fault divorce, uh, about no-fault divorce. But it, uh, certainly, it was never uncontroversial. And any um, change in uh, terms of marriage ha have always had their opponents and their alarmists. I probably have about 20 minutes more questioning. Okay. I have about 20 minutes of additional <coughs> questioning. I can do it now or if the court would like to break now, whatever the court prefers. Let's, uh, let's move along and maybe you can squeeze that 20 minutes down and okay. in. Okay. <laughs> I can take a hint. <laughs> Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Professor Scott, I caught in, in the um, – once coverture ended in California, in other places in the United States. Did that put an end to the laws of marriage dictating spousal roles in this country? Well, not entirely, because coverture lent a very, very long shadow to the marriage relationship. And the gender asymmetry of roles uh, with respect to who was the expected provider in the family and who was the dependent was then reinvigorated in, um, in the level, at the level of federal policy with many New Deal provisions, particularly Social Security, which gave special additional benefits to a married man when he got to the age of collecting his old age pension. If he had a wife, his wife would receive 50% uh, of his, uh, his uh, benefit that he would get as a single individual. And this was a very definite material advantage to those married spouses as compared to single individuals. And uh, it was a very major step in what has become uh, the federal channeling of benefits through the marital relationship. But it was gender specific. It, it did not give, even if a wife had been, and she could be in the 1930s, the principal earner in her family, and her husband had been her dependent. That was possible in real life, but uh, by the time they aged, she would not be able to collect a spousal benefit for her dependent husband. So those things were challenged in the 1970s, and, uh, and the Supreme Court found that those spousal assignments uh, within the marriage institution were, were unconstitutional. Uh, but that, that was, uh, I would say, that was a reinvigoration of certain expectations of coverture that, that gave asymmetrical roles, and particularly gave the husband the role of the provider, the main the main agent of the family. And did those asymmetrical gender roles persist into the, into the 70s? Uh, well, in, in the federal benefits, yes. Most How about certainly. culturally uh, from a historical Well, I think this, that the, the cultural, um, certainly the state's role in assigning benefits to marriage itself, those material advantages, is one of the, one of the things that holds up the particular prestige that marriage has. It's in a reciprocal relation with the other cultural valuations. Um, uh, but yes, I think that um, that the, all of these state benefits that prescribe a certain way of living tend to have cultural impacts. And, 
after the challenges in the mid-70s to the um, spouse specificity, the gender specificity of, of various federal benefits, um, I think it's been uh, actually been a great benefit to that and has enabled wives who might want to support their husbands to be able to do that without thinking, oh, well, if we did that, when we retired, we'd be at a great disadvantage. In your view, as a matter of historical analysis, is the institution of family <coughs> important to American society? Yes, indeed. In your view, is the, um, the raising of children and responsible raising of children an important value in American society? It okay. is. Yes, it is. In your view, would providing the ability, providing individuals of the same sex the ability to marry, um, be consistent with those two American values? Yes, I think it would be. Why? I think it's clear that couples of the same sex are going to form intimate relationships and rear children. Of, of their own or adopted. And it seems to me to the public's interest for them to be able to do that in marital units that are recognized as such and honored as such. And that's even without speaking about the individual dignity that being able to participate in marriage will um, impart to the individuals. But from a social point of view, given the extent to which marriage benefits uh, from, from the point of view of the state have been always about establishing continuity and stability in households and social order. It seems to me this is a direction that the state would want to go to pursue that aim. Mr. Thompson asked you some questions sprinkled throughout about polygamy, and I'd like to ask you a few questions about that briefly. On page 213 of Public Vows, do you have it in front of you? I think I do, because I was looking at it before. I forget which number it was in the tab. Tab 31, I believe. Thank you. Top of 213, I believe, the first full paragraph. And Mr. Thompson had read the sentence about this stance has allowed hundreds and perhaps thousands of fundamentalist Mormons in Utah and Arizona to revive polygamy. When you wrote that sentence, were you in any way endorsing uh, polygamy? Absolutely not. And, and were you suggesting in any way that it was it had become legal? Uh, I'm just trying to find the oh, exact sorry. spot. I was on 215, I think. Here we go. Uh, First full paragraph beginning with yeah. the word community. No, I, as actually I say in the next sentence, uh, the open practice of polygamy unprosecuted, although it is illegal, as well as officially disapproved by the Church of the Latter-day Saints. Uh, I, I think I was really pointing to the ways in which the, most states do not prosecute <coughs> behavior that is seen as private, um, even when it is formally against the law. That is, I think probably many states still have adultery as a crime on their laws. I don't know for sure, but I think it has remained in many states' uh, legal codes. But the states do not prosecute adultery, uh, not in the state's motivation. An angry partner might, but that's something else. Uh, and so what I really was emphasizing here is the extent to that that the um, the, the extent to which marital behavior um, has become more uh, you know the state has given more latitude on marital behavior I think this example personally I think this is an egregious example <laughs> of state uh, non prosecution of something that is illegal and not at all in the tradition of American marriage when you evaluate the sweep of history in America, is, is there um, anything that suggests to you that um, the recognition of the ability of individuals of the same gender to marry would somehow create a slippery slope or uh, pave the way towards lawful polygamy? I do not think so. Why not? Well, monogamy, as I said yesterday, is not only um, 
has not only come down to us through the common law and through its Christian background, it also has a political foundation in the American Republic. Uh, yesterday when I was talking about the founders' um, emphasis on the consent and voluntary allegiance that they hoped for from the, the to-be citizens of the United States being analogized to the consent and voluntary allegiance in monogamous marriage, they made an explicit uh, contrast to polygamy, which in their political view could only be associated with despotism and non-consent because in, in, their, in their eyes uh, they couldn't imagine why a woman would agree to marry a man if he already had wives, that she must be being coerced. And through the long campaign against Mormon polygamy before Utah entered, was allowed to enter the Union, this theme of polygamy equaling despotism whereas monogamy equaled consent and free choice was a political theme. And so I think that monogamy is very, very deeply ingrained in the American political tradition as well as having uh, certainly a religious background and, um, and a common law background, a more specific common law background. And what, in your view, um, as a historical commander, the laws of incest, Mr. Thompson referenced those, have they served? Well, as I um, understand it, they, these are some of the many hygienic, thought to be hygienic or eugenic laws that many states have put into their codes. And uh, <coughs> actually, hygienic laws have varied over time, usually in tune with what is thought to be scientific in the period from the 1880s through to the 1930s with the rise of eugenics to very high status. There were very many laws put into states saying that certain people considered feeble-minded couldn't marry or other characteristics and categories that we don't really use today or don't consider legitimate. Um, and for instance, but on the question of first cousin marriage, these marriages were very uh, highly thought of and were often the most status-filled marriages in um, the antebellum South, for instance. It was a very common way for rich families to consolidate their holdings over land, to have first cousins marry and not lose the family property to complete outsiders. But um, that uh, then most of the states decided that first cousins shouldn't marry, that it was eugenically ill-advised. So these things have shifted and, and the states, of course, do retain certain restrictions on marriage, particularly age of consent, age below which no marriage can be contracted. In your view, do, do uh, laws allowing individuals of the same gender to marry suggest or jeopardize those other restrictions in any way? I don't think so, no. Um, l let me ask you one or two I think final questions. Um, as a historical matter, is there any basis for concluding that allowing individuals of the same gender to marry would affect population growth? I don't see any reason for uh, concluding that, no. Um, has there been a separation of church and state as to marriage uh, in this country since its founding? Yes. As a historical matter, does the fact that uh, civil marriage borrowed and looked to some traditions from religion uh, in formulating the law, does that make the institution of marriage in this country uh, a religious institution? Uh, we are a multi-religious society and our civil marriage serves to keep that a harmonious society. Different religions may place their requirements on marriages, but they are not superior to the civil law validation and authority over marriage. Are you, based on your study of history, a believer in the uh, public institution of marriage? Uh, I believe it's a very valuable institution. And do you think its value will be enhanced if individuals of the same gender are allowed to marry in this country? I think that judging from the way their advocacy over the past 20 years has raised the status of the institution in many people's eyes, made them appreciate its benefits, I would expect that, yes, amplifying it to allow them entry would be 
uh, very beneficial to the institution. I'm going to consult with my colleagues. Thank you. All right. I believe that's the end of my question. I just wanted to make sure as a formal matter that the exhibits on the list that I had presented to the court were uh, admitted into evidence before Professor Cott steps down. That's my understanding, along with those referred to uh, by uh, Mr. Thompson. <coughs> those were the judicial judicial. That's notes. correct. Uh, let me ask, uh, while you're on the stand, uh, Professor, <coughs> you described a marriage as an instrument of governance. How is it that the state or government became the principal uh, formulator of the rules of this governance, rather than uh, the governance being left up to contractual relations between the parties or private institutions? Well, I, I think that simply, well, let me put it this way. Uh, our marriage rules are inherited from the, the colonists uh, who originally were in this nation. And in both, uh, in, in both England in the common law and in the civil law, there were long traditions of governmental authority over marriage. Under the civil law, they were not ex exclusive to the government. That is, for three, four centuries in Europe, there were great tussles between the church and the state over which of these authorities should control marriage because of the extent to which it was a governing vehicle. But in all of the modern um, monarchies in Europe, the, the state won, and certainly in the one most relevant to our institutions in the United States, in Britain, the state retained control using the church as the ceremonial partner in marriage. The United States form, uh, growing up from the colonies, was even more decidedly toward the secular authority. I think it had a great deal to do with the fact that religious authority was very poorly established. Ecclesiastical authority of the Church of England was extremely poorly established in the early United States. And there simply weren't, wasn't the biomass around to uh, enter. But in so, the, what you're saying is state regulation of marriage was not invented in the United States. Oh, certainly not. Certainly not. It came here as part of the heritage of yes. those who settled in the United States. And what were the driving forces behind this growth of state regulation of marriage? Well, I, I wouldn't say growth. I would simply say that the, the states were the ones who, who set the terms from the beginning, from the beginning, from colonial legislatures to state legislatures. I think what's, uh, perhaps this will clarify. But I understood you to say that the state's role in the United States was more expansive, more vigorous than it had been in Europe. Is that a fair? No, simply that there was no contest between <laughs> state and church of anything like the proportion that the contest between monarchs and the Catholic Church uh, that occurred over centuries in Europe. But not, not it's simply that there wasn't a, so much of a contest. It was civil and civil authority, not 100 percent, but you know, majority percent from the beginning. Maryland, for instance, was a more Catholic colony. It had more ecclesiastical authority over marriage. But certainly from the founding of the United States and the establishment of state governments as compared to colonial legislatures under the British Empire, in all the state governments, uh, secular authority over marriage was established and was considered part of the police power, the power of the states over the health, safety, and welfare of their population. And marriage rules were seen as part of that police power, and it's one of the reasons that they ha this power to regulate and define has remained at the state level and uh, does, it is, by the Tenth Amendment, is actually not part of federal um, power to prescribe, although federal policies on marriage have greatly affected marriage, the states have the right to define marital entry, exit, et cetera. 
Was there some sort of vacuum that this state power was flowing into and filling? A vacuum because there was the absence of private regulation or regulation by private entities or institutions? Well, in, in the Anglo-American tradition, marriage has always been a matter for governance. It was, certainly it involves private... By state governance. There's private well, governance and state governance. Oh, that's, okay. That's the distinction I'm trying oh, to draw. Oh, okay. I, I apologize, <coughs> Your Honor. I, when I use governance, I am using it with respect to governmental authorities. And private contract is an essential to marriage. The, the contract of two parties to consent to marry one another. But that contract to marry is not valid in our nation unless the state joins in as a third party and says, I credit your private contract. That's what I meant in the very beginning by saying marriage is this unique public-private blend in that it requires private free consent, but it involves the public in um, monitoring and setting the terms of whether that consent creates merely an informal relationship or a valid marriage. And what are those interests that uh, the government has in this contract between the two marriage partners? Well, I think the interests are, as I was suggesting, in um, bundling certain social rewards with the duties that are imposed on the couple by the state in order to uh, incentivize stable long-term household formation and care of the couple for one another. The, uh, that reciprocal bargain in marriage long ago when it was unequal and today is one spouse takes up the obligation to support the other in marriage and that is enforced by the state. And you're saying in the absence of that and you're saying in the absence of that bargain there are certain harms or externalities or social costs that flow and it's in the state's interest to regulate. Yes, the state has always seen it as in its interest to regulate it. Yes, and I think that interest continues. Very well. Thank you, uh, Professor Cott, for your testimony. You may step down. And why don't we take our luncheon break at this time. Be back and ready to go if you can at uh, 1.30.